All right. So, a little bit about the theme. Black Instrument and this 2023 theme. So I pulled these snippets from two dot dog sites and one from the Smithsonian. Just so you understand what is out there and what people are saying about it. So this is Black Resistance explores how African, and the brackets are my um, edits. So Black Resistance explores how African Americans have resisted historic and ongoing oppression. And then from slavery and abolition to other ongoing struggles for civil and human rights. And by resisting, African Americans continue to mobilize resources and shape social movements to create a space for black Americans to thrive. All of those things are true, all at the same time. So today, as you notice, I am dressed in something African that I got from Nigeria. And um, I've had it for a while, I didn't just get it from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, I wanted to invoke Peter Tosh. Usually when you think of Peter Tosh, one song comes to mind, this is not it. But it's, that's not an issue we have in, in Port Alice because we've already legalized it. So today we talk about don't care where you come from, as long as you're a black man, you're in Africa. No mind your nationality, you, you've got the identity of an African. And this song is from 1977. So if you know it, fine. What I wanted to read to begin, and so you understand how um, Black History Month is situated in the minds of the government, is the proclamation that the president did on January 31st. Uh, I'll be quick with it, because it's kind of long. During National Black History Month, we celebrate the legacy of black Americans whose power to lead, to overcome, and to expand the meaning and practice of American democracy has helped our nation become a more fair and just society. This country was established upon the profound but simple idea that all people are created equal and should be treated equally throughout their lives. It is an idea America has never fully lived up to, but it is an idea that we've never fully walked away from either. The struggles and challenges of, black of the black American story to make a way out of no way have been the crucible where our resolve to fulfill this vision has most often been tested. Black American struggles for freedom, equal treatment and the right to vote, for equal opportunities in education, housing and the workplace, for economic opportunity, equal justice, and political representation, and so much more, have reformed our democracy far beyond its founding. Black Americans have made a way not only for themselves, but also have helped build a highway for millions of women, immigrants, and other historically marginalized communities, and all Americans to more fully experience the benefits of our society. From the start, the Biden-Harris administration has been committed to using the power of the federal government to address the long-standing disparities that have hampered the progress of black communities. On day one of my presidency, I issued an executive order to advance equity and racial justice in every policy we pursue. I began by appointing the most diverse cabinet in American history. I have continued to nominate a historic number of black judges to the federal bench, including Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. During the height of the COVID-19 crisis, my administration provided relief to hardworking families which cut the rate of poverty in black American communities to nearly a third and cut the rate of poverty among black children by more than half. My healthcare policies have dramatically increased healthcare, healthcare access and reduced costs for black American families and capped insulin bills for seniors at $35 per month per prescription. A little bit extra there, but okay. We are also working to address centuries of neglected infrastructure in black American communities. My administration is leading the replacement of lead pipes embedded in cities across America so that every child can safely turn on the faucet and drink clean water. We're expanding public transit and providing high-speed internet to every neighborhood in the country so parents can get to work and children can do their homework in the comfort of their own homes. We're using every avenue to confront racial discrimination in housing and in mortgage lending and to help build generational wealth in black communities. We're working to ensure that any housing agency that receives federal funds will reach beyond the simple promise not to discriminate and will instead take meaningful affirmative steps to overcome historic patterns of segregation, giving every person a fair chance to live where they choose. We're addressing the negative impacts of redlining, 
and other forms of financial discrimination, and we are working to end a discriminatory system of appraisals that assigns lesser values to black-owned family homes than to similar homes owned by white families. Additionally, we've invested nearly six billion in historically black colleges and universities. We have also taken historic action to ease the burden of crippling student debt, um, action which benefits so many black students and families. I'm proud to have permanently authorized the Minority Business Development Agency and to have given it expanded authority to help, black, help grow black-owned businesses. I've set a goal to increase the share of federal contracting dollars uh, going to small disadvantaged businesses by 50% by 2025, which will bring up an additional $100 billion in capital to these businesses. In May 2022, I signed an executive order promoting effective, accountable, and transparent community policing delivering the most significant police reform in decades. Among other important measures that increase transparency and accountability, it raises policing standards by banning chokeholds, resisting no-knock warrants, and requiring body-worn cameras on patrols and during searches and arrests. It creates a new national law, uh, law enforcement database to track records of misconduct, and it aims to safely reduce incarceration, support rehabilitation, and re-entry and address racial disparities in our criminal justice system. Additionally, I signed three new hate crime bills, including the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, which finally made lynching a federal crime. Equal access to the ballot box is the beating heart of our democracy. Without it, nothing is possible, and with it, anything is. I restored the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, appointing top attorneys to oversee enforcement of civil rights laws, and the department has doubled the voting rights enforcement staff. Every agency of my administration has offered to expand access to voter administration and election information. These are all important steps, but I will continue to push Congress to repair the damage to voting rights uh, in this country by passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement and Freedom to Vote Acts to ensure that every American has a voice in the democratic process. This year, on what would have been Dr. King's 94th birthday, I was honored to be the first sitting president to deliver a sermon at Sunday service at his cherished Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. The life of Dr. King demonstrates that democracy is an enduring covenant that must be persistently renewed. Nothing about it is guaranteed. During National Black History Month, we honor and continue to work with black Americans who've created a more fair and inclusive democracy, helping our nation to move closer to the realization of its full promise for everyone. Now, therefore, I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States, by virtue of the authority vested in me and by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim February 2023 as National Black History Month. I call upon officials, educators, librarians, and all the people of the United States to observe this month with relevant programs, ceremonies, and activities. In witness thereof, I send my hand to the All right. So that's a lot of systemic stuff. And I think what we need to get to would be the people who actually help to make a difference. Because he's saying a lot of laws and, you know, it's a proclamation and we still have systemic issues. So if we look at this slide, and I got this slide from Dr. Robin D'Angelo. She has a book called White Fragility. And in her, one of the presentations that she did, she had this slide and I thought it was quite powerful. So she said, you know, he's sort of going through what are, what are the things that state has sanctioned against um, African Americans. And we come through with all the things like kidnapping and 300 years of enslavement, torture, rape, and so on. Quarter way through the slide, we have bans on testifying against whites. So black people were not allowed to testify against white people. And this is about, probably at this point, we're at like Dr. Snyder's age group, all right? And we continue, we come down, then we get to employment discrimination. And we are in 2018. 2018, when the one I looked at this morning actually was one where a group of nine people in Texas were awarded $70 million because they were discriminated against at work. This was just a couple of years ago, right? And then we continue. And these things are now current. So there's not, not a whole lot there that you don't know. I believe that if we use emotional intelligence, there are ways that we can bridge gaps that currently exist. So on this slide, I just go through what is emotional intelligence. And when we think of emotional intelligence, we hear the name and we think 
It has to do with intelligence, but it does not. Not in the way like IQ, right? So emotional intelligence is the ability to identify and understand your own emotions and those of others. And then you use that identification and understanding to regulate relationships with others around you. So there are four pillars of emotional intelligence that help guide you. And you may or may not know whether or not you are emotionally intelligent, but you can point out some things, you know, and you figure that out today. So self-awareness is one of the pillars. So understanding who you are in relation to how you relate to other people. How do people see you? Who are you when you are at home, at work, at play, right? Self-regulation. How do you manage your own emotions? If something happens, do you throw a tantrum? Do you, you know, how, how do you handle your own emotions? Empathy. Are you able to commiserate with someone if something sad happens to them? Are you like, well, that's their problem, they'll figure it out. You know, how, how are you, if somebody's, something good happened to somebody, can you celebrate with them or not, right? And then the last one is relationship management. So those are the pillars, and I mentioned that in the beginning, because now I'll go through some history and then we'll come back to how emotional intelligence can help. So going back to resistance, we started, meaning black people, we started with resistance from very early. So resistance here, I'm looking at the middle passage. So if anybody's a history student um, or not, we might know about the middle passage. So the middle passage is a part of the triangle with how slaves got to the Caribbean, right? So initially, what they were trying to do, they were taking slaves to the Americas, getting tobacco and cotton to Europe, and then getting textiles and rum um, to Africa. Right. And those of you in my 313 class know a lot about the rum that we have in the Caribbean. Um, resistance to slavery. So there are a number of things that people were fighting against in this middle passage. Things that occurred naturally. It was a long journey. Um, so this is a journey that took like 80 days. Uh, ideally, it's like a three-week journey, but you know, you're going there with ships that are not equipped and we're thinking eons ago, so it's not like a cruise ship where you could get from Miami to wherever and back. No, it's not like that. So some of the things that they had to encounter were diseases, starvation, the length of the journey, the conditions on board. And I put this quote in here from Black Panther because it meant a lot. So it says, bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped off from the ships because they knew death was better than bondage. And when I saw Black Panther years ago, and I saw that, I'm like, whoa, okay. But I, I thought it was sort of like art imitating life, because it, it was important. But nobody really wants to jump to their death. But if you understand how atrocious slavery was, then you can understand why they'd want to do that. Here in the US, there's a lot of things don't necessarily relate. It's not the same story that happened every place, but here in the US, there was one instance in May 1803 that was called the Igbo Landing, where a ship that was bringing slaves here from Nigeria, they landed outside of Georgia. And there was a mutiny on the ship. They overthrew the people that were on there. And then they, they were chained together, and they walked into the sea. So they essentially was a mass suicide. And, and, and so that is where that quote came from. <coughs> So if we look at a little bit of a timeline in terms of how um, we got to where we are today. I'm using the, the Caribbean um, experience. In 1562, Sir John Hawkins, who of course was English, he went to Sierra Leone and took 1,200 Africans captive, um, took them to Spanish-occupied settlements, right? Then between 1624 and 1627, the English settled in the vacant island of Barbados. Who's Barbados vacant, right? <laughs> you know, they didn't see anybody there, so they just settled there, occupied it and stuff. Um, between 1627 and 1640, Barbados had agricultural ventures um, that were small farms cultivating things like tobacco and cotton and indigo. And the laborers there were indentured laborers. So they had contracts where they would come from other places They'd be there for five to seven years, and then they could leave at the end of it if they wanted, right? 
Then 1637, sugarcane was imported from Brazil to Barbados. So Brazil is in South America, so they went upwards. Now the Brazilians um, might have come from Benin. When I was talking to Dr. Gary about it, he says there's a door of no return um, in Benin. In many of the West African countries where the slaves would come from, there's a door of no return. So they know once they went through that door, uh, well, we know now, once they went through that door, they weren't coming back. And most of the slaves from Brazil had come from Benin in, in um, West Africa. Barbados in the 1940s had 800 black people to 30,000 white people, right? But remember, Barbados was vacant, so we see how they got it. Um, Jamaica in 1655 was taken from the Spanish. Barbados developed a slave code in 1661. Jamaica developed a slave code. And the slave code was explaining what the laws of the slaves would have been. So you could work your entire life and die there, or you could work for a specific period and then you could move to some places. And right? so everybody had a slave code. Well, almost everybody. Um, and this doesn't go through all 13 independent Caribbean islands and 12 territories right now, it does not. 1669, Barbados accounted for 80% of the Caribbean islands' total exports of sugar. So they knew exactly what, they, it, it, remember slavery is a capitalist system, so let's start with that. It was a system, so it benefited one set of people. In 1670, Jamaica became an English colony. Remember they were Spanish before, so they're English then. 1672, the newly established Royal African Company founded by the House of Stuart is financed by the wealthiest and commercially influential merchants, aristocrats, and royalty. The RSC regulated the English slave trade of Africans to a legal monopoly over 2,500 miles of the West African coast from the Sahara to Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. 1675, same company granted a charter to carry African captives to the Americas. 1702, Antigua develops a slave code. 1730, the first maroon war in Jamaica. Jamaica is known for their maroons, actually. Um, so they had a rebellion against the British, and 1739, they got, some, they got a treaty and got some maroons free. 1670, Taki's War, again, Jamaica, mainly African people were rising up. 1763, major rebellion in Burmese, Burmese is in Guyana. Um, and so they were going to form a maroon community, but that was averted. But that rebellion is one of the more popular rebellions in the Caribbean. 1781, 133 Africans were thrown overboard while still alive from the slaving ship Zongo so that the owners can claim insurance compensation money. Capitalist system. 1791, an uprising by the enslaved in San Domingue, which, which is where Haiti is now, triggered the Haitian Revolution led by ex-slave and military tactician and general Toussaint Louverture, and everybody else gets afraid. They're like, oh no, biggest country is rising up, what are we gonna do? 1792, Henry Dundas, the first Viscount of Melville, countered William Wilberforce's insistence on an immediate abolition of slavery in favor of gradual abolition of slavery. 1795, another war, Maroon War in Jamaica, a rebellion in Grenada, House of Commons in 1776 settles on a year that they would end slavery. 1804, Haiti gets independence and becomes the first black republic and they paid for it every day since then. 1807, bill to legally abolish the transatlantic slave trade was passed by the House of Commons. 1816, we have a revolt in Barbados. 1823, revolt in Demerara, which is Guyana. 1833, uh, we get the bill for the abolition of slavery and then the abolitionist, William Wilberforce, he died. And 1838 is when we get to when indentureship first started. So obviously a lot of things were left out, but those were some key dates. So then we get to resistance in terms of religion, because now we've had these people here, we've enslaved them, and we've given them our religion. Because they came with their religion, but you know, you can't associate, and they speak a language that you don't understand in all of us. So now, we've given them a religion. So for 300 years, they were able to maintain their own religion, the religion of 
Baptists struggle to convert slaves while maintaining their own sense of African identity because they wanted to maintain their identity, so they were fighting against it. But black preachers who were literate made some inroads because they were reading now and they weren't allowing them to read in the way that they wanted to. African religious ceremonies and the words of the Bible formed Pocomania, which is a religion in Jamaica now that come from Kumina, which is an African religion. But all the while, they are resisting these systems that are bothering them and, and are over them, so to say. Spiritual leaders within the slave community drew the ire of planters because it was these people who were brave enough to be leaders who were leading these revolts. So they were not the favorite of people. Um, then we get to the abolition of slavery. As I said before, the Slave Trade Act uh, was in 1807 and all across the Caribbean. Slavery was abolished in 1834, but it was still happening in the US. But I want to draw those linkages now because you know, we, it's the same set of people that are under these systems. We have four years of indentureship in the Caribbean. And then one of the things that is really interesting is that when slavery was effectively abolished in 1834 in the Caribbean, ex-slaves at this point, now they're indentured laborers, and they would work to like pay off what they're being given which is a weird system, because if you're free, you're free. Now, why are you working for four years to pay back this land that you've now earned? But, you know, what else can you do? So what they did was pool up to buy villages. So in Jamaica, in 1835, they bought a village called Sligoville. In Guyana, in 1840, they bought a village called Buxton. And in Barbados, in 1841, first set of free slaves bought a village called Rock Hall, and those villages all still exist. And they're revered in those places because it shows you we are able to do this if we work together. That, that's kind of the message that you know, we keep celebrating. Then, of course, we keep going in the resistance theme. There's resistance to colonization. And I said before, Haiti was the first to get independence. So Haiti became independent in 1804. And then the Dominican Republic, which shares the island with Haiti, wanted independence from Haiti. Um, and th that happened in 1844. Then all these other places became independent. So Cuba, 1902. Jamaica, 1962. Same year as Trinidad. Guyana, Barbados, 1966. Bahamas, 1973. Grenada, 1974. And then the US invaded Grenada some years later. Suriname, 1975, Dominica, 1978, St. Lucia, 1977, same year as St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Belize in um, Antigua, Barbuda, 81, and St. Kitts in 1983. And these are the places that they got emancipation from, if you know the flags. So if you don't, it's France, um, Haiti, the UK, and Spain. Then we move on to Garveyism. So this is Marcus Garvey. He is Jamaican. He lived from 1987 to 1940, and he's very important in the Pan-African movement because Marcus Garvey is someone who actually started the UNIA, which is the United Negro Improvement Association. He founded that in 1940, and he wanted to have a system of black economics where people could actually buy back and build now from everything that they had lost before. So you wanted to get people together um, in terms of you know how they would progress from there. He formed the Black Star Line, which is a shipping company that would take goods following the same slave trade route. He would take goods that people wanted in European countries there, and he would take people back to Africa, because he believed in this repatriation movement. Um, he was imprisoned in 1923, him and a partner for mail fraud, uh, where they're trying to sell s uh, shares of the Black Star Line via the mail. And these letters were opened, and then he was thrown in prison for five years, and then deported thereafter. He became Jamaica's first national hero. And Garveyism is still something that a lot about well, Jamaica. He's, he's Jamaica's first national hero. He became a hero in 1969, so after his death. And 
Garveyism is still something that we talk about every Black History Month, Caribbean American Heritage Month, we talk about Garvey. There's a lecture you know, um, in his honor and so on. This year, Councilwoman Yvette Clark and I think Hank, Hank Thomas, they have submitted a bill for his exoneration so that his name is cleared because he was wrongly, wrongfully imprisoned. So that is another important part of the story. Then, so now people are independent. They, we're doing the garden thing and so on. And then we get to what's called colonization in reverse. So people are free now, and England needs to continue their economy and they need people to work. And they need people because the jobs that they have now, um, or the needs that they have, and this is in from the 40s, going up to like the 60s, just about when Jamaica's ready to get independence. And Miss Lou, who's a poet, she's a poet laureate from um, Jamaica. She wrote this poem in 1966. I think it's funny, I just want to read a little bit of it. So she says, what a joyful news, Miss Matty. I feel like my heart will burst. Jamaica people colonizing, England in reverse. By the hundred, by the thousand, from country and from town. By the shipload, by the plane load, Jamaica is England gone. Them are poor out of Jamaica. Everybody future plan is to get a big time job and settle in the motherland. What a island, what a people, man and woman, old and young, just a pack them bag and baggage and turn history upside down. Some people don't like travel, but for sure them loyalty, them all are open up cheap fare to England agency. And we can weak them shipping off, them countrymen like fire immigrate and populate the seat of the empire. Wanna see how life is funny? Wanna see how they turn about? Jamaica live for box bread out of English people's mouth. For the when them catch a England and start them play them different role. Some will settle down to work and some will have to settle for the dole. Jane said the dole not too bad because they pay in cheap two pounds a week to seek a job. That suit her dignity. Me say Jane will never find work at the rate that she da look. For all day she sit on an fan couch and a read love story book. What a devilment of England. Them face war and brave the worst. But me wondering how them going stand colonization in reverse. <laughs> so I thought that, that was quite interesting. So now you have people going back to England, you know. Um, and then I put Windrush here because a number of people from all of the English, former English colonies went back to England in the 40s on a ship called the Windrush. And the descendants of those people are known as the Windrush generation. I don't know why I call them that, but you know, um, that's how they kind of identify them. A number of people have also been deported because when they got there, they didn't have the correct paperwork or whatever. And England being England, now, is trying to rectify you know, the whole thing and some people just didn't have the paperwork. But the 40s were just, just the other day. My parents were born in the 40s. Um, then we get to like one of my favorite things, Rastafari and cultural resistance. So Rastafari is a movement. Well, I would have put Rastafarianism, but because Bob Marley has a song that talks about preaching against the isms and schisms, I decided not to put Rastafarianism. <laughs> so Rastafari and cultural resistance. Right. So if you all know Bob Marley, you all know something. Um, so this, it started in the 1930s in Jamaica, after the coronation of Rastafari Mahoney. And he had become his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie I. Based on the teachings of the Bible that the Rastas actually follow, for them, he was the second coming of Christ and a redeemer for black people. Don't ask me further than that, because I can't tell you. But I know that if you, if you get a chance to talk to a Rasta, do, because they're very interesting people. Rastas have, I put on the bottom, their own lingo there. Rastas say things like they speak in positive terms all the time, right? At least Jamaican Rastas anyway. So you would ask them stuff and they would be iry, right? Everything is iry for Rastas. Jamaican kind of follow the whole thing. Um, 
there's a dish in, in Jamaica called rundown, which is made with like coconut milk and um, ground provisions and whatever. And the rest is because they only speak positivity. They call it run up, right? So it's not run down. Um, and they have other things that they say. Um, they talk about Rastafari liberty. Um, and it's grounded, Rastafarianism is grounded in the religious principles of Protestant Christianity, mysticism, and Pan-African ideology. So Rastas are intending to repatriate to Africa, right? Um, and when you talk about mysticism, you, you might know Bob Marley's song, Natural Mystic. There's a natural mystic flowing through the air. Bob Marley is perhaps the most popular Rasta man that we know. Um, he has been sort of like the poster child. Even now in his death, he would have been 70 something um, at the beginning of this month. And like I said, Rastas are into repatriation. So they still believe, even now, um, that they should be going back to Africa. And there's, there are several movements to do that. So now we come back to emotional intelligence and how after knowing all this history and understanding where I have come from, where black people have come from, because you know, I'm taking the liberty today of saying that we're all the same black people, even our African brothers and sisters over there, we're all the same, I see y'all. Um, so, yeah, no, they don't, we're not really all the same, but, and I was explaining to um, Dr. Gandhi today that Africans look at Caribbean people as if we got away. Like, we, we escape from something in Africa. But that's not the case, because where we live in the Caribbean, are you saying it's true? Oh, Because <laughs> that's how you are. But the thing is, we, we didn't necessarily choose to go. We were put on ships and cast off. But we're in a situation now where we keep looking back to Africa. And if you see, like now, Mia Marty, who is Barbados' prime minister, she has uh, um, an ambassador to Ghana. They have like so many countries now we're actually reaching to make sure that you know, we maintain connections and so on. And I was talking to Dr. Gandhi about it. He said, we don't have money to go and look for y'all in the Caribbean. We still poor in Africa. So I'm like, oh, I didn't think about it like that. But don't look down on us like we got away. We didn't, but you know. So back to emotional intelligence now. What we want to do is to be able to see or to identify what are the things that you can do that will help us. How do we build allyship? Because we struggle with a lot of things, like I just explained there. A lot of things have followed us all the way here, hundreds of years later, and we still have to deal with it. Right? So what can you do? There are things that you can do to help. So you can learn. Learn things, and I'm talking now within uh, uh, Black Resistance, Black History Month, Black, all Black context, really, right? So you can read books by Black authors. So because most times when we write as Black people, we write from a place of knowing, and we even like the songs that we, we sing and so on, comes from a place of explaining things that have happened to us. So the hurt that we feel and so on. So understanding and reading things. And I think I had one more. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So this one is, I'll read some of this. This is from Black Stalin, who is, was a Calypsonian. He died earlier this year. Um, Calypsonian from Trinidad and Tobago. And a Calypsonian is someone who sings Calypso music. So Calypso music is, is native to Trinidad and Tobago. It is the slower version of what they jump up to on the road with feathers and beads for carnival, like they did two days ago. So in the Calypso, generally, they are singing about things that are happening in society. And they've they become sort of like the mouthpiece of the um, society, right? So in this one, and this song is from 19, I want to say 87. This one is called Burn Them. And he says, Judgment morning, I by the gate and I waited because I begging the master to give me a work with Peter. I have some sinners coming. With them I go be dealing because the things that they do, I want to fix them personally. Peter wait, Peter wait. Look Cecil Rhodes by the gate. Bun he, bun he. So Cecil Rhodes is from South Africa. 
Peter Luck, the Englishman that sent Cecil Rhodes to Africa land. Bon he, bon he. Peter, take Drake, take Raleigh, but leave Victoria for me. Queen Victoria he's talking about. Bon she, bon she. Peter, I don't care what you say, but Mussolini, he can't get away. Bon he, bon he. And he continues with all the people that he's going to burn because now he has this job on judgment morning with St. Peter by the gates of heaven. So another systemic thing that we have internalized and you know we're, we're singing against. So one of the things that you can also do is to understand the system. Because what we have, what we all live in, and nobody's exempt because we're all in this system. We all still, people are dealt with differently in the system, but we're all a part of it. So what you can do to help is to understand the system and see where things are going wrong. And the young people that help fix the print and so on, y'all are the people that advocate and agitate for stuff. Y'all are the Swifties that know that Ticketmaster has an issue with young people who are getting things changed. So Ticketmaster is actually a part of a system that is capitalist and is holding everyone hostage. So if you need to go to a concert, the only place you can get a ticket from is Ticketmaster. And all those fees that they add on there, you don't know what they're for. And the artist doesn't see it. The venue doesn't see it. But, you know, it goes to Ticketmaster. So Taylor Swift got her people on there. So now that they're done with that, apparently they're going to start on the price of eggs. So get on it, Swifties. Um, then learn about thought leaders, like within, within the black movement. Um, you know, people who are, who are or were important, so like Marcus Garvey, um, like Bob Marley, and, you know, other leaders. There are a number of people I could have mentioned but didn't because we only have but so much time. Um, so, you know, Malcolm X and, and everybody, you kind of bring everybody into one because as you see from how we moved and now how we currently move, globalization allows us to move from place to place. Globalization, immigration, emigration, all those things. You can visit museums and you can do that virtually. I mean, the pandemic really has left us with some wonderful technology that we can go to places without necessarily going to those places, but it allows us to learn. You can act. You can act by supporting a black business, like deliberately buying from black businesses, right? You can donate because obviously with your money, you're a stakeholder, meaning that you are, you can determine whether a company fails or flounders, right? You actually have the ability to, you're either an employee, um, a customer, you work in the community, and businesses need to be held accountable. That's basically how stakeholder theory works. You work for the government, whoever, but you're a stakeholder, so you can, you can do that. Activism, which is probably the most important one on this slide, because that's how America functions. We get, we, we activate for a lot of things, and so, you know, one of the things you could do is activate. Policy change, I mean, the, the president said a lot of things, um, but in, in 2023, if you're still having to say those basic things like providing water, and notice everybody was lumped in there. You know, it, it was just, it was for everybody. Okay, but this is Black History Month. So, you know, it's a system that still needs a lot of work. So, policy change, you can write to your congressperson. That's not something that we do in the Caribbean. We don't write to Congress people at all. <laughs> it, it, it really doesn't operate like that. Our system is not like that. So when we tell people that we are able to you know, send a letter to a representative, like, huh? you didn't just vote? So, no. Mm -hmm. So this is, is actually a very, very democratic situation. And um, don't take it lightly. You can listen. You can listen to us without being defensive. Because a lot of times when we start to talk about race and racial issues, people tense up, you know. And um, that's not what it's for. Sometimes we need someone to advocate on our behalf. So if I need something done, and I figured it might be easier for a white woman to do it, I would go and say, well, here, can you get this done for me? And you ought not to be able to, well, well, like, why can't you do it yourself? You know, think of where I might be coming from and how, it, how much courage it may have taken for me to ask you to do it on my behalf. It's not that I didn't want to do it, but I figured it may be easier. And for you, you're not even thinking that this could be why I'm asking you to do it, you know? 
So if you want to help, you can help us, you know, do things like that. You can celebrate tonight. Thank you all for being here so that you're celebrating with us today. Um, attend the Black History Month event. Uh, create a playlist. I mean, apparently everybody likes Beyonce, so that's good. <coughs> but, you know, there are artists outside of Beyonce. So, you know, we can do that. Um, support a TV show. So the things that you watch and know, the way that algorithms work and, you know, people have Netflix and whatever else, you can watch some black shows, you know, there are things that are wholesome and there are things that are funny and whatever. Um, then you can watch a black movie, like Black Panther, I guess, and all the other good ones. What can you do at work? So at work you can do definitive things, like help to close the diversity gap. And the diversity gap is still huge, you know. And I'm happy to be here because for me, um, they say that Diversity is being invited to the party. So I'm at the party, you know, I'm here. <laughs> and then, but inclusion is being asked to dance. So don't just have people and they're there as tokens. You know, you young people advocate for stuff like that so you get people involved. So I'm happy to be here and dancing. Um, highlight events in your newsletters and I think he and Abby does a really good job of that because you always get stuff and it, it really is diverse. You can hire speakers to visit. Um, I'm trying to get some people into the music um, to do like to host music workshops and stuff because I know some diverse musicians who I think are very good who come from the Caribbean. I mean there's no shame in that. I put that at the top of my wish list and I sent it off to the music department so let's see. Uh, you can also volunteer with black-led organizations because black-led organizations may not necessarily be just about black people, but it, you, what you could be doing is supporting someone's rise to help them get on the road to equity and equality. So an organization may be black-led, but not necessarily black-owned, right? And then be intentional about your language. And the example that I like for this one is when we say um, who's the person that, that broke the color barrier, the baseball person? Right. So we say that Jackie Robinson got to play, but no. He was allowed to play. He was always good. So you know, if you say things like that, how are you, how are you framing it? So who's a part of the problem? Right? So we have to watch how we frame things because people internalize that kind of thing. If you say things like black people weren't allowed to ride the bus, you know, um, before Rosa Parks or whatever, they had to sit in the back of it. But they're still black now and they can do it. So what happened? So something changed. So the languaging is also important and you realize that the system had to change for that to happen as well. And then more than anything else, live past February. So after today, if you see me in the club, come and tell me hi. You know, don't just be, you know, because I'm like a regular person. I come to all the events, you know. I'm probably the most fun black person on campus. But <laughs> it's not an election, but whatever. <laughs> so, you know, live past February. So those are some of the things that you can do. And we understand how being self-aware so you see yourself and you can also figure out from that how I might perceive you then it allows you to come to me or any other black person and talk to us we're not gonna bite I know we you know we say things like um, angry black woman and you know all the other stereotypes but we may not even be thinking that our face looks like that but you know if you stop and talk to us we'll answer and then you want to think about how you're going to manage the relationships, not just between us, but among the society that we have to live in. All right? All right. It took a little longer than 25 minutes, but um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions, any comments? Thank you.
was a very wonderful and educational presentation. Can we give her another round of applause? Please? Well, on behalf of African American Affairs and the Multicultural Center, we would like to present Dr. Lunchy with a very special gift. We would like to present her with this vase oh. that was handcrafted by the tribe of Kenya. Oh, thank you. We hope you would like it. Yes, yes, I do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this presentation. We really loved it. All right, thank you guys. Now for the raffle, can you please take on your tickets? If anybody else gets a vase, I'd be very upset. <laughs> <laughs>